Uh, this is browser eyeballing is not equal to JavaScript testing. Obviously, we're going to be talking about JavaScript testing. My name is Jordan Casper. Uh, you've got my Twitter handle up there on the screen, as well as a link to these slides. They're online now. They will continue to be online. Feel free to uh, follow along, hit them up afterward. There's a bunch of links throughout the slides, so um, you might want to do that, uh, uh, bookmark that so that you can refer to those links afterward. Brief introductions. Uh, I work for a company called Append2. I'm a senior JavaScript engineer there, as well as a team lead. Uh, so I, I work in JavaScript literally every single day. Um, we build a lot of really heavy front-end uh, client applications, uh, but we also do a lot of node development. Uh, we do a lot of code reviews of existing JavaScript applications. We do a lot of responsive web design, uh, things of that nature. Uh, I have been coding since 1993. Uh, I've been coding JavaScript since about 98 in the dark times. And uh, feel free to hit me up afterward if you have any questions even not related to JavaScript testing. So what we're going to talk about today, um, first of all, we, we have to talk about writing testable JavaScript code. Most people that want to test their JavaScript are not actually writing testable JavaScript code. You're writing code that is nearly impossible to test on an individual basis. Right, we don't want to be testing your code end to end every time. A lot of times we want to test individual functionality. And in order to write those unit tests, you have to write your code in a way that is actually testable. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about, talk about setting up a testing framework. And I'll mention a few frameworks. We're going to pick one just for the sake of time and, and ease of demonstration. And then obviously, writing tests and a little bit on automation at the end. And if we have time, depends how fast I get through the material and how many questions we have, uh, I've got a little extra content on automation. So we'll see how far we get with that. But we'll at least cover a, a few basics. So uh, I'd like to know how many of you identify with this testing process. Uh, you write some JavaScript code, and you look at it in Chrome or Firefox or whatever you want to test it in. It looks pretty good. Then you write something else, and you change it, and it breaks. And then you spend a couple hours fixing it, and you just basically do that over and over again, right? And then you test an IE like two months later, <laughs> and, and you realize that it's not going to work. And uh, th the real problem isn't that you're testing an IE two months later necessarily. Um, the real problem is that you have no idea what the problem is. You don't know if the issue with your code uh, is your code, or if it's that Inter Internet Explorer is um, Internet Explorer, uh, and and that's kind of one of the one of the biggest problems is you don't know. And so what we're going to talk about is writing tests that will actually test the functionality individually in your code, and not necessarily your application end to end, which obviously is important as well, but is a completely different topic. Uh, so first of all, we need to talk about the better way to write your code. So we need to talk about writing testable JavaScript code, uh, and this comes in many formats. I'm going to put up a sample of code here. And it, I know it might be a little hard to see in the back, but we're going to break it down and go to individual sections. Um, very simple little piece of code. It's using jQuery, but that's not the important part. The important part is just the general functionality. So what's happening here is we've got a little input. And uh, when the user uh, submits the form that the input's in, instead of doing a typical submit form submit, we're going to do an AJAX call for some search results, get back the search results, and dump them into an unordered list. It's pretty basic functionality, some stuff that you would probably do you know, 100 times in an application, right? Someone types something in, you do an AJAX call, you get some results, you dump it into the page. Pretty basic. So you might look at that and say, well, you know, what's so bad about that? Well, let me strip out some of the internals and just show you uh, this part. And I've bolded some of these lines here. And what I want you to, under to recognize here is that each of these bold lines is a function. And if you'll notice, we've got one kind of top-level callback function when the document is loaded, when it's ready. And then you've got you know, when the submit occurs. And then you've got when the AJAX call comes back. And then you've got um, a for each uh, looping through the results to put the results into the page. So we've got functions inside functions inside functions inside functions. And the problem is every layer that you go down, there is no way to test that. There is absolutely no way for you to test any of those inner functions by themselves. Zero ways to do that. You have no reference to that function, and thus you cannot call that function outside of this execution context. 
And that's a really big problem. But in addition to that, you'll notice that all of these functions are unnamed. And so this is what you get in your call stack when you get an error. You look in dev tools or, or F12 tools or whatever you're using, and you see anonymous, 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 anonymous. Because none of those functions are named. They're all in line, declared in line. So beyond just testing the code, you can't even see where the problem is. So we're going to talk about that. We also have some really tight DOM coupling here. And you might say, DOM coupling? Well, I'm in a web page. Of course there's DOM coupling. But JavaScript code these days is moving more and more toward uh, a separate, separate execution, uh, or not execution environments, but separate context. So you've got, whether you're doing some kind of MVC model, or whether you're doing MVVM, or whether you're doing whatever it is, the idea is that you've got a bunch of business logic and you've got a bunch of view logic and mixing those two is going to be really bad. First of all, it means you're not going to be able to reuse your code. Second of all, it's going to make this testing really hard because in this case, I have to have elements that have search hyphen form as an ID and search hyphen query and search hyphen result. If those elements don't exist, this whole thing fails. The whole thing fails. So instead of doing that, when I want to test individual functionality, I can pass in those required DOM elements and say, hey, use this element for the search and use this element for the results. So we want to decouple our business logic of performing the search from our view logic of displaying those results or capturing input from a view. And we also, of course, have some server coupling here where we've got this Ajax call that's going to go and get the results from the server. And the problem is, well, I personally, when I do JavaScript work, I'm not working with a server. I hardly ever work for a server. I work in professional services, so I've got a client that wants me to write all the front-end code, and they've got some back-end that who, who knows what's it, what it's in, but they've told me what the API is. And the problem is I don't have their application running on my local machine. So how can I test this code without having that server? So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how we can test these things and get, uh, get around some of those, those coupling issues. So, of course, the solution is to refactor this code. So we're going to take that code, and we're going to refactor until it hurts, and then you're going to refactor a little more. And I always tell people, because they, they always look at this and say, well, that's a lot of code to refactor. There's a lot of things going on there. Obviously, this is a simple example, and there's still a lot to refactor. But you've got to take it incrementally. You've got to say, well, I can pull out this function, name it, give it its own context, and then inject that function. You can do this in an incremental fashion such that you're refactoring the most risky parts of your application and just moving forward from there. Maybe you can't do the DOM uncoupling. Maybe you can't do the server uncoupling for some reason, but you can take an iterative approach to this. So just really uh, simply, we can break out all of these functions. There's absolutely no way uh, that this could really harm your application. We break out these, uh, these functions into named functions. Now notice I've given it a little um, namespace here, window.jk, and no, I'm not kidding. That's, those are my initials. Uh, and so you've got window.jk, and now I can put all of my methods onto this namespace. Of course, you might be using something else. You might be using... AMD modules, you might be doing uh, require.js, you know, whatever the case may be. You break those things out, in this case just to a simple namespace. So now I've named all of these functions, and I've also given them inputs, and we're going to talk about those in a second, but just by doing this, I now get this as my call stack. Now, I'm still, there's still all some minified file, and it's all on line three because I've got my banner comments, and then it's all on one line, and you know, whatever, that, that is what it is. But at least now I get the call stack, and I can see the execution uh, flow when an error occurs. So that's one huge benefit that you get just in debugging. So this is my initialization function, right? So I've got some initialization function, and now if you'll notice, I've got two inputs. So I'm going to accept the form, which I need to attach a handler to, and I'm going to accept the input, which I need to get a value from. So I'm accepting these things as input into my function, and then, of course, I add my submit handler. And then inside the submit handler, all I'm going to do is grab the value from the input that you gave me and pass it off to my do search method. So that's all that this thing does. And I can test that all day long. All I got to do is make sure that do search gets called and that it gets called with the right value when a submit occurs. That's really easy to do. Really, really easy. Notice here on my submit handler, it's not just function, open parentheses, close parentheses, open bracket, close bracket. I've given it a name. Your inline functions do not have to be anonymous. I get people in every single session that come up after and are like, I didn't realize you could do that. Any function can have a name. Even inline functions like this can have a name. And what does that do? Well, if we go back, it does this. 
Notice in my call stack here, one of them is submit handler. So I know, oh, it went through that function. Great, I know that it went through there. Name these functions. There's no reason not to name them. You might argue, oh, well, that's an extra, what is it, 12 characters. Who cares? 12 characters is not going to matter these days. I'm sorry. You might say, oh, well, if I do that for every function, I well, first of all, you probably shouldn't have that many inline functions. So you're going to be naming them anyway, aren't you? Because that's how we're going to test them. It's really not that much more. And if you're going to minify and uglify your code, then it's really not going to matter. Because they're going to get shortened to one or two characters anyway. You also need to, of course, initialize this. So you might notice that I skipped over the document ready function, but now I've got it. So when the document is loaded, I'm going to call this initialization function. And notice that I pass in the ID for my form and my input. So again, I'm, I'm passing in those. This might be on the HTML page, but I don't have to test that. That's not what I'm testing, that the document gets loaded. That, that's not what I'm testing. What I'm testing is that the initialization function for my search functionality works. So it's completely separating the loading of my document and kickoff from what happens on kickoff so that I can test that independently. The do search method is, is pretty much what you would expect. All it does is accept the value, and it calls our, uh, our AJAX endpoint and has some success in error handlers. Notice that my success in error handlers both are named functions. They're not going to do very much. They're going to be really lean. All they're going to do is call some other function. But they are named, so I can see that execution flow. Uh, notice also that in my uh, arguments, I accept both the value that I want to search for, but I also accept a callback function. And that's going to be really important. If you're using promises, that's totally fine. You could return a promise from this function. But you need some way to know that this thing finished because it's an asynchronous action, and we can only test it once that asynchronous action completes. We're going to get to that when we get to our testing framework. Uh, so I mentioned in my um, AJAX call, in the success handler, all it's really going to do is call handle results. So I call handle results with the data returned from the AJAX call. What does that let me do? Well, first of all, I can call handle results from anywhere. So I could do it on document load. I could do it on search. I could do it on some other related search. I could do it anytime I need to because that functionality is completely segmented and isolated. And I can test that that functionality and that functionality alone works. In the error handler, of course, you know I might do some kind of pop-up. But notice, in both of those cases, I have my callback function that gets executed. That callback function is what's going to allow me to test that this functionality, the do search method, actually worked. Handle results, pretty basic. I'm going to pass in the node. But you can see I might do something like, well, if you gave me a node to put all these results in, then I'll use that. And if you don't, then I'll assume that you've got some ID on the page. Kind of lets you simplify the code in your production environment. But in your development environment, you can say, oh, no, I'm going to inject this DOM element that I want you to use that's in my test harness. And of course, I still loop through the results. I still dump them in. But now I've got uh, a much better idea of what's going on. And I can test just this functionality, see what happens there. OK, so you're going to need to refactor all of these things. But there's more that you could refactor in there. I touched on some of the big things. But you can refactor so much more out of that and make it really, really highly testable. So let's talk about the testing frameworks. Obviously, this is really why we're here. There's a lot of different testing frameworks these days. I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. This is not a talk about different testing strategies, per se. This is an a introduction to JavaScript testing. Uh, these are the frameworks that are probably the most popular right now. Uh, I've used all of them. However, for today, we're just going to focus on one that is a little simpler to digest when you're new to JavaScript testing. So we're just going to focus on QUnit. Uh, QUnit was, is a testing framework that was developed by the jQuery core team. Uh, they created it to test jQuery. So this is what they use currently. Um, and it's a very simple introduction to testing. Um, it does not actually follow the XUnit path. So if you're familiar with PHP unit, it doesn't really follow that uh, paradigm exactly. But it is very similar, more so than these other frameworks. Just for those that aren't as familiar with testing in general. Um, we are going to have some kind of test suite. It's not actually called a suite in QUnit, but let's pretend like it is. And inside of that, you've got some grouping of tests in, in QUnit. It's called a module. And inside of modules, you've got multiple tests. And inside of tests, you'll have multiple assertions. So these things are all nested, and we can execute them at different levels. Uh, setting up QUnit is really easy. Uh, obviously, you're going to go and find it and download it. Or you could use something like Bower to install it. This is a typical QUnit HTML file. This is not a snippet of the file. This is 
the entire file that you could potentially need to run your QUnit tests. I know it's kind of hard to see in the back, but let's look at it individually. So in your head, you're going to have some link to the QUnit style sheet. This is just so that the results you know, are pretty and don't look terrible. Uh, in your body, you're going to want to have, or you could do it in your head, you're going to want to have the script tag for QUnit. So this is the actual test library. Just put those anywhere, really. Inside of the body, you also need two divs. Uh, these divs are required, and they do have to have an ID that matches these IDs on the screen. The first one is just QUnit, and the second one is QUnit hyphen fixture. They do have to be just like that. Uh, that's the first one, QUnit, is where QUnit's going to put its user interface. So the results, being able to rerun tests, things like that, all go in that QUnit div. The QUnit fixture is where we put HTML that we want to be available to each test and to be recreated for each test. So you dump some HTML into the QUnit fixture, and before each and every single test, QUnit is going to reset that HTML to whatever it was when the document loaded. So that's pretty nice if you need to just throw in a UL for our test results and a form, and you wanted that form and those test results to be reset before each test, we dump that HTML into the QUnit fixture, and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about resetting it yourself. Of course, we need the script tag for our source code. So whatever that, that is, you need to include that as a script tag. And you need to include a script tag for your tests. You could just put these in the page in line. I actually see that pretty frequently. I like to separate it out to a different file so that I can include those tests in different suites if I wanted to. And that's it. That's the entire HTML file for your QNIT suite. So that's, that's our test harness. That's our suite. That is uh, what comprises a, a run of tests. So in the test file, obviously, you know, your source code is whatever your source code is. In the test file, what do we have? Well, we have something like this. So um, if you remember my source code, I've got the namespace there and our initialization function. And then in my test file, I'm just going to have a call to the test function. Notice it is globally available. You can also access it off of the QUnit namespace. Um, you actually see this more often. It's, that's why I put it up here, because it's very simple. The first argument is the name for this test. Pretty basic. The second argument is a function that's going to get executed when this test runs. So that function is going to execute when this test runs. And inside of there, I've got two assertions. They just use the OK assertion. So I just call the OK function. And the first argument is some truthy or falsy value. So in my case, I'm passing in JK, the namespace. And all this test is, is that value truthy? So an object is truthy. If JK were undefined, this t that assertion would fail. But since JK is defined as on the window as our namespace object, that, test, that assertion will pass. The next assertion says, hey, is the type of init search a function? If it's a function, that assertion will pass. My whole test then passes, and I'm good. The second argument there to, this, to these assertions is just a message. It's not a success or a failure message. It's just a message that identifies that assertion. That's really it. it. Not success, not failure. People kind of get caught up on that. It's just an identifier. So if I were to run this HTML file that I showed you earlier and just load that HTML file in a browser, I don't have internet access. So, give me a sec. Uh, this normally runs very smoothly. I'm sure you're very familiar. So while, connect. While this is connecting, uh, you're going to get uh, a UI that's just going to identify all the tests that passed. It's going to identify things like the browser agent that it ran under, how much time it took, how many assertions were run, how many assertions passed, things like that. Let's see if this iframe will load. So this was actually a live iframe on my site to see those results. And that's not going to run. So I can't show you that QUnit UI. But the thing is, you don't want to do that anyway. You're going to want to run it somewhere else. Uh, you're going to want to run that in uh, some kind of automated fashion, which is what we're going to get to in a few minutes. Um, just real briefly, when you see this interface, all you're really going to, oh, there it goes. Ha ha. Huzzah. OK. So what you'll see here is all the stuff that I just told you, and then you see that uh, that first line is our test. It says 
namespace exists, which was the name of our test. And you can see some little numbers next to it, which basically tell you how many assertions were run, how many succeeded, how many failed. You get little green bars next to them, and yay, everybody's happy, right? If we wrote a failing test, this is what you would see. Notice that it automatically opens up to the failed test, the, or failed assertion, excuse me, and the failed test. The first assertion passed, so you get the little green bar on there, right at the top there. And then it tells you that one failed. It tells you what it expected, what actually happened, and it gives you uh, the diff and the source, so you know exactly what test, where, what line in what JavaScript file that test is located, so you can go and look at it and figure out what failed. So this is the, the QUnit browser UI. This is what you see when you just load that HTML file that I showed you earlier in a browser. There's your tests, and you're done. And that's it. Yay, testing. Of course, there's more. There's lots of assertions. So I showed you the OK assertion. That one's pretty easy, truthy, falsy, right? And then there's equal and not equal. And that takes three arguments, not two. So the first argument is uh, what you... I believe the first argument is what you expect, or what actually happened. The second argument is what you expected, and then it shows you the diff. Of course, it doesn't really matter because all it's doing is comparing those things, right? So obviously, equal, not equal, pretty obvious. You also have strict equal and not strict equal, which is necessary because JavaScript interprets strings and numbers to be the same if they can kind of be coerced into the same type, right? So strict equal and not strict equal will enforce that strict equality. Deep equal and not deep equal are useful in limited cases. Please do not ever use deep equal for some complex object. That's a really bad idea. If you have a simple list of properties, sure, fine. Deep equal is fine for that. Do not try and use this for comparing the window object to something else. It will bog down your tests. It will run forever, and it's terrible. Uh, not deep equal, obviously just the, the inverse of that. And then we've got throws. Throws is actually really nice. Uh, if you use exceptions, if you use the error object in JavaScript in your code, and you need to know that when I pass in a bad argument to this function, it should throw an error, you want to use throws. Throws will catch that error and say, okay, this assertion passed because it threw an error, because that's what you expected to happen. Otherwise, that error would get thrown to your test harness function here, and then it would get you know, thrown back up, and your whole test would fail, right? So if you've got errors that you know are going to be thrown and you want them to be thrown, use this to capture those, and you're all good. Uh, notice that this takes a function, right? So you take that function, and then you can do assertions within that throws block if you wanted to. So uh, we're going to write some more tests. First of all, um, we've got our initialization function, right? And so what we might want to check on for our initialization function is that our submit handler is actually there. Because that's one of the primary things that the initialization function does, right? Is it attaches that submit handler and then passes off the value of the input to the do search method. So that's easy. Uh, in jQuery, you can do this. There are actually ways to do it with core JavaScript, but I'm already in jQuery, so I'm just going to use it. Um, and this isn't a class about how to get event handler names off of the DOM object. So in jQuery, you can just do this, where we've uh, grabbed the search form that we know we passed in to initialize search. Right, so we passed in this search uh, ID, and then we're going to go grab that ID and grab the events off of it and look through those events and say, well, is there an event handler in there called submit handler? So we're actually verifying that our submit handler was attached correctly. It tests a couple of things, but you can see the benefit there. That's the primary function of our initialization function, so that's what you want to test. A lot of people wouldn't test something like this. They'd be like, oh, well, of course the event handler gets attached. And then your test fails, and you don't know why. Your handler function never gets fired. And you're like, wow, why does my event handler function never get fired? Well, because the event handler was never attached. So this tests that first. And then you can test all the other stuff. So for my handle results method, I might want to say, well, I need to make sure that the case where there are no results is handled correctly. So I can call my handle results method, call it with an empty array. Remember, this is completely detached from our Ajax call, completely detached. So I can call it with no results and just ensure that in the search, the results node, that I have the right text. So uh, maybe I'm supposed to put, there were no results into that node. Maybe not. Maybe you're supposed to do something else. Maybe you're supposed to throw an error, and you could do a throws block here. 
But whatever you're going to do, you want to make sure that you're testing all those cases. Test that you get an empty array. Test that you get one entry in the array. Test that you get multiple entries in the array. Test that you get more entries than you expect to display. You know, if you're expecting to display 10 and you actually get 20 back, what do you do? Do you just display all of them? Is that really what you want to do? Make sure that you're testing all those things, and you can do all those things with these assertions. So I want to talk a little bit about grouping tests, and then we're going to talk about asynchronous tests, which is super easy, actually. Um, QNIT allows you to do this, and so do all of those other uh, frameworks. By the way, all those assertions that I just talked about, all the other frameworks have assertions. Some of them are named slightly differently, but they're all very similar. In QUnit, we use test modules. In something like Jasmine or Mocha, you use describe blocks. So they're all very similar. Uh, you just give that block a name. So in QUnit, we call the module function, and we pass in a string that identifies that module, and every call to the test method after that, those tests get put into the module above it. And so as soon as I make that second module call right here, as soon as I make that second module call, all the tests under there are put into the immediately preceding module. So that's how QUnit groups those. And if we look at that in the UI, you can see that uh, our test runs here are actually, it might be hard to see in the back, but, yeah. so it identifies the module name first and then the test name, and then of course the results. One thing that QUnit also does is in the top right corner there, you've got a nice drop down, and I can actually rerun individual tests, or individual modules, excuse me. So I can say, oh, rerun all the modules for X or all the modules for Y. Are the tests for module X, all the tests for module Y. So that's just a, a very simple grouping mechanism, but it also, also allows you to do uh, things like lifecycle functions. So basic testing lifecycle, which is true in QUnit and true of most of the other testing frameworks that I mentioned, uh, you have something where you've got some start of the whole suite. You've got the start of an individual module, a start of an individual test, and then, of course, you've got all the assertions that run. And once all those assertions finish, you have the completion method for some test, the completion message method for the module, and then the completion method for the suite as a whole. And QUnit allows you to tie into each of these events. So in your uh, test harness, or in some external JavaScript file, either way, you can add a qnit.begin call right there and pass in a callback function. So that callback function will execute as soon as qnit begins running your tests. So if you need to initialize some stuff, you can do that in there, and as soon as that function finishes, then your suite keeps going. And of course, you can do that with module and test levels as well. When qnit finishes, you can do qnit.done, and this is really nice for doing any kind of logging. Maybe you've got an external test log server that you need to say, yes, this test passed, that's where you're going to do that. And in fact, when you start doing continuous integration with JavaScript tests, that done function is how you tell the continuous integration server, yes, all of my tests passed. And perhaps, you know, here's the results, whatever you need to do. As I mentioned, you can do module start and module end. And notice that the module done function there, that callback function, accepts the name of the module, how many tests failed, I'm sorry, how many assertions failed, how many assertions passed, and how many assertions there were total. So you can actually get a lot of the statistics in those done functions in order to do that logging that you need to do. Test start and test done, pretty much the exact same way, although test done also gives you the name of the module that you're in. So uh, most of the time when uh, I see companies that come to us and say, oh, well, we can't test our asynchronous stuff in isolation because, you know, it's got to have a server. Well, first of all, it doesn't. It's not that hard. It's actually really easy. And of course, it's not just AJAX calls, right? There's other asynchronous stuff that goes on. It might just be an event handler that gets fired. It might be that you've got some set timeout or some interval that you want to make sure is actually executing when it's supposed to be executing. There's lots of other instances where you might have asynchronous code that is going to be difficult to test. And you might say, why is it difficult to test? Well, when we have that test function, that text function is going to execute all of your assertions in order, and when it finishes, it moves on to the next test. And it reports, when that function finishes, it reports to QUnit, hey, all of these assertions passed. Well, if the function finishes and it was asynchronous, there was some, there was some action in it that was asynchronous, then guess what? Your assertions haven't executed yet by the time the test function finishes. And so what does it tell QUnit? I didn't have any assertions to run. That's a problem. First of all, it's a problem because QNIT might fail silently because it would say, 
okay, well, you didn't have any assertions, so zero of zero assertions passed. That's 100%. Well done. Not really what you want. So we need to test all of this, even the asynchronous stuff, and how we're going to do it is really easy. Uh, so there's our do search, just to refresh memory. We've got this AJAX call. It's got a success and an error handler. We start, instead of with test, we start with async test. You can actually just use the test method as well, and you can call a start method. When you call start the start method, or when you initiate an async test, it tells QUnit, hey, I'm going to do some async stuff, so hold on. And it waits, and it lets you do your async stuff. So we do our, our, uh, our call to do search, and when do search returns, remember we've got that callback function that we added? So when do search completes, when that AJAX call is done, we call this callback function, we either get results or we get an error, whichever one we're expecting. We do our assertions on that, so maybe we make sure that the results are what we expect. Maybe we make sure that an error was actually returned to us, whatever the case may be. And when all that's finished, we call, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we call start. Stop would be the function you call to stop it, obviously. So we call start. And when you call start, you're telling QUnit, okay, I'm good, keep going. And now QUnit says, okay, let me see how many assertions were run now. How many failed? Do I need to fail that test? Do the reporting, stuff like that. Super, super easy to do asynchronous testing. And all of the other testing frameworks have something like this. It's really very easy. Do not ignore your asynchronous functionality when you're doing testing. But you don't want to rely on a server, right? It's hard. I got, I've got this server, and I don't want to have to have it up and running locally. I don't want to have to have a test server up and running. Your JavaScript code doesn't care about your server at all. You might think, well, but I've got AJAX calls, and the AJAX calls care about the server. No, they don't. The AJAX calls do not care about your server. All they care about is that your handler functions get called with the data they expect. Right? It doesn't matter that the AJAX call actually happened or not. What matters is that you get the right data into the function. And so what we need to do is mock out that stuff. And here are a number of tools for doing so. If you're doing jQuery, you can use jQuery MockJax, which is actually a product that my company wrote. Um, if you're doing uh, Jasmine tests, if you're running with Jasmine, Jasmine Ajax. If you're doing Angular, you can do it with the Angular HTTP backend using uh, ng-mock. Um, if you're not using any of those and you're doing a custom framework and you're not using any other outside framework, you can use Synon or Synon. The founder actually pronounces it both ways. I don't know why. Um, and it does a lot more than just mocking out AJAX requests. It will also do full dependency injection. It will do uh, spies, function spies. So there's a lot of different things that that that, that tool will do. It's a, a pretty robust tool. All of these tools are going to let you completely isolate your front-end code from your back-end by simply capturing those AJAX calls and saying, oh, I'm going to capture it. No, don't go to the server. Instead, just respond with this test data. Um, I actually have a blog post up. If you just Google my name, you can go and find it. I just posted it like two days ago. No, yesterday. Just posted it yesterday um, on how to mock out a server for JavaScript testing. So feel free to go and find that. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details of how to do that. But look at these tools. They're really fairly simple to implement. This is just a simple mock JAX call. Um, all you can see here is that you just match a URL, right? So the easiest way to use MockJax is you just match a URL and you have this uh, response text that just says, hey, when I hit that URL, instead of going to that URL, just respond with this text string. And you can see that's a JSON string, so it will respond with the stringified version of that JSON object and return that to your callback function, never hit a server. Completely isolating your front end code from any server that may or may not exist and allowing you to test in an automated fashion with exactly what data you want to test with, zero results, one result, multiple results, errors, 404s, 200s, whatever. So again, just a, a simple, simple view of that. So I'm going to move into how we're going to automate some of these tests. So obviously, loading up all of these tests into a browser and just sitting there and hitting refresh after you change some code is really, really, really annoying. And we don't want to do that. We want to automate this. First of all, you can't load those browsers up and do that with a continuous integration server and expect any kind of performance. It's actually really, really difficult. I used to do it in the dark days, uh, 2005, when that's all we really had, because we didn't have automation tools. But now we do. 
Uh, and the automation tool we're going to use is Grunt. There are a couple of other ones. I'm talking about Grunt. We can debate the other ones after the session if you wish. Now, Grunt is actually a Node module. So in order to use Grunt, you have to install Node. So go install Node, and then after that, you use uh, the Node Package Manager, which gets installed with Node, in order to install Grunt. Um, the first thing that we're going to have to do to set up Grunt, though, is we're going to have to create a package JSON file. This is a Node construct, but don't worry, we're not doing Node development. We just need to use this to tell Grunt what we need. So this package.json is about the simplest you can get. All you do is give it a name and a version for your application, and then this dev dependencies object. So it's just a JSON object, very simple mapping of what dependencies you need for development. Now, the only one that we need is Grunt right now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to our command line. No one run away. I said command line. And we're going to install the Grunt command line interface using this, npm install dash g grunt dash cli. The dash g flag there just says to install it globally. So this gives you the ability to run Grunt from your command line. That's what that does. The second line actually installs the Grunt execution environment in your project. So npm install dash dash save dev puts it into your package JSON. And now you've got Grunt installed for your project, as well as the Grunt command line interface for you to actually execute those on your machine. And again, refer to these slides. I'll have a link to them at the end. Just go through and do these commands. I promise they'll work. They work on Windows, Mac, Linux, doesn't matter. So now you need to create a Grunt file. The Grunt file is what's going to tell Grunt what tasks you want to execute. Grunt is just a task runner. It's, it's a framework. You have to tell Grunt what tasks you want to run. This is really a boilerplate file. I use this file, and I just basically copy and paste it over and over again in each project. And then we fill in what we need, what tasks we need for that project. You can really ignore almost everything. All you really need to know about is what's in this to-do line here, and then we're going to have to load some modules here at the bottom. So grunt tasks are anything. They're literally anything. Copying files, concatenating files, minifying files, um, appending files, testing files, uh, pre-compilation steps for SAS, um, image optimization. There's all sorts of things that I've used it for. It can really do quite a bit, and you can write your own stuff. It's a Node module, and Node is on the server, so you have full access to the file system. You can really do anything with it. Uh, we're going to install one plugin for Grunt, a Grunt task, and this is the QUnit runner. So this is the thing that will actually run the QUnit tests for you. You can see that we've done that dash dash save dev flag again, remember? That puts it into our dev dependency so you don't have to touch your package.json file anymore. It will automatically update that for you. And it's grunt dash contrib dash qunit. That uh, contrib piece right there, that tells you that the grunt core team is maintaining this package. And that kind of gives it a little bit more credence. Um, if you see one that doesn't have that, you might be like, uh, I'm not sure about that one. And maybe try and find one that is a grunt dash contrib. So that's the task that we're going to use. So we've installed. What is that? Oh, fun. <laughs> uh, so we're going to we installed that script, and now we're going to go. Remember, I had that to do line in our grunt config file or our grunt file. Now we're going to add this task. So this is just a JSON object in right where that to do line was. So the top level is our task name, QUnit. That's defined by the plugin that you install. So QUnit, it has to be called QUnit. It can't be called anything else. That second level, though, where it says basic, that's a target name. The target can be anything you want to call it. Whatever you want to name it, you can name it whatever you want. I'm just saying these are our basic tests. You might have uh, search tests and user tests and authentication, uh, you know, some other uh, footer tests and menu tests and tests for all different parts of your JavaScript code, and those could all be different targets. Inside of your target, you've got different options. So I've got that options block, and inside that options block, I specify the URLs that I want to test. So remember, QNIT runs inside of an HTML file, right? So I have to tell the QNIT runner what URL I want to load. Now notice I've just given it a relative URL. So relative to where my grunt file is, you can find the HTML file, the one that we created earlier, at this location. So grunt is going to load up that HTML file and execute your, grunt, your uh, uh, QNIT test for you. Um, and I, uh, One last thing at the bottom here. Notice that we've loaded the NPM module. So Remember, everything's running through Node, so we had to load up that module, and it's just the exact same name as the plugin that we installed using NPM. You just add a line for each task that you add. 
And I also want to point out one thing. You can kind of strip this down. The QUnit plugin doesn't have a whole lot of options. Uh, out of the box, you don't need many. So a lot of people will condense it. So I've still got my task name, QUnit. And I've still got my target name, basic, but then I've just collapsed everything else into this one array of files that I want to test. You actually see this format much more often. And remember, notice that that's an array, so I can add multiple HTML files there, right? We'll get to that in a sec. So I've created this grunt file. And you might be saying, but I can't run them from the command line. QUnit runs in a browser. So what do I do? There's no browser, right? You're on the command line. You're not going to open up a browser. But you need a browser. So what we're going to use is QUnit in combination with PhantomJS. Now, when you install the QUnit Grunt plugin, it installs PhantomJS for you. You don't have to do this separately. PhantomJS is a headless browser. Headless. There's no visual representation. Everything is running through the command line. You might say, well, that's not really a browser. It is, I promise. It's really a browser. It has a window object. It has a full document object model. It can run JavaScript. It can render CSS. It is a full browser. You just don't see anything. What that means is all of your JavaScript tests and all of your JavaScript code can execute just fine inside of it. It can position elements within the window. You can check their position using JavaScript. You can render CSS and make sure that that CSS puts things where you expect it. Everything you can do with a regular browser, you can do here, just on the command line which means it runs really, 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 really fast, and you don't have to worry about spawning new browsers. One caveat, it's one browser, right? It is one browser, and you probably want to test multiple browsers. I'll mention that at the end. So I'm going to go back to my command line, and I'm going to run my tests. So I execute the command grunt, which got installed with the grunt CLI that we did earlier, and then I specify the task, and then a colon, and then the target. So remember, there's task and target. There's, it's a nested structure here. So I execute grunt, qnit, colon, basic. And it says, I'm running qnit basic for you. And it says, I'm testing core, uh, test slash core.html. And then it's got a couple of dots. That's not an ellipsis. The dots are not an ellipsis. Each dot represents a test that you're running. So each dot is a test. And at the end, you'll get this green OK. And at the bottom, you see done without errors. And it tells you how many assertions run and how fast. Notice this ran in uh, 21 milliseconds. You think that's faster than you opening up a browser and hitting refresh? Probably. And that's it. Really easy command line integration for your QUnit test. And now you could execute that command from any other continuous integration tool you might have. Whether you're using Jenkins or Travis or you're using Fing or whatever you're using, you can execute any command from the command line using any of those tools. If you get a failure, this is what it's going to look like in your terminal. It's going to get a big red F instead of one of the dots. And it's going to give you the message, and it's going to tell you what the actual value was, what the expected value was, and it'll give you a stack trace uh, from the test file all the way down to your source code. Yada, yada, yada. And then at the bottom, you get this aborted due to warnings. And that's really what you want to see, or what you're looking for. You don't really want to see it. No one really wants to see it. We can add multiple targets. Remember, I mentioned it's a nesting structure. So I've got QUnit, and then I can have basic, and then I can have search. So I can have different levels here. As I mentioned, those are arrays, so I can tack on extra HTML files and test multiple. But you can also use a globbing pattern. So I could say for the search, it's test slash search slash asterisk.html. Find all the HTML files inside of that subfolder and execute all of those. So you can really set up really complex uh, groupings of tests here so that you only want to test these things, I only test those things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mentioned, so you saw this, this is how we ran our QUnit basic. If we want to run QUnit search, we would have to do grunt QUnit colon search. However, it's a nested mechanism, so if I just ran grunt QUnit, it would run all of the targets, so don't have to worry about that. And if you add it to your default task, then you can actually execute just grunt, and it would run all of the tasks that you have defined as default. If you are really interested in Grunt, there is a talk tomorrow. Does anyone know? I think it's tomorrow on Grunt. It's today. It's today. Thank you. Um, so there's a talk later today on Grunt. I would highly, highly recommend it if you're going to do anything with JavaScript testing because this is the de facto standard for automating your, your uh, JavaScript tests. Um, and I'm sure that talk will go into much more detail on how to configure Grunt, which I don't have time for. Is it 345 
There you go, 345, room 17. Thank you very much. So um, that is the end of the primary content, and I wanted to go on to some extra content, if you're willing. And I'll come back to this slide so you can get the link there um, and the link to review it and such. Okay, so I wanted to make it a little bit easier for you because you still got to go back to the console and run grunt qunit and then go back to your code. And, uh, it's kind of annoying, right? So let's, let's make that a little easier for you. We're going to do that with the watch plugin. The watch plugin does very much what it sounds like. It watches things. So first of all, we've got to install it. So this is exactly like we did before, right? npm install, dash dash save dev, grunt contrib watch. So you know it's maintained by the core group of grunt. Yay. And then we've got to configure it. So we create a new task in our grunt file.js. The task name is watch. And notice that our target is JS. And of course, you could watch other files, right? You could watch CSS files or SAS files. You could watch HTML files. You could watch whatever. We're watching, uh, our target name is JS, and what we're watching is in this files list. So in the files list, I've used this globbing pattern to say, go to my source directory and use the double asterisk to go to any subdirectory within source. So any subdirectory, any level down, go into any of those and find any file with a JS extension. So that is going to watch all of the JavaScript files in our source directory. And there's the tasks array. And it says, OK, when any of those change, execute these tasks. And notice I've just got qunit. But I could say qunit colon basic or qunit colon search. So when this subgroup of JavaScript files change, run this subgroup of my tests, right? So I've added the watch plugin. Don't forget you have to add the load npm tasks line down here at the bottom of your grunt file. So now I've added the watch task. Let's flip back over to our console. So in our console, I'm going to run grunt watch, and it's going to say, OK, I'm running the watch task, and then it's going to say waiting, and it'll just sit there. And it waits. So this is my workflow, like day in, day out. This is my workflow. I've got two screens, right? And I've got my code on one screen, and I've got this in a terminal on my second screen, and I run grunt watch, and it sits there and waits. And then I just code along, happy as, as ever. I make some changes to a JavaScript file, and I save that file. And as soon as I save that file, it says, oh, I noticed the file changed. And it runs my QUnit tests. And it says, done without errors. And notice at the bottom it says, waiting. And all I do is I glance over, I see green, and I keep going. And as I'm going, I'm continuously testing my code. And as soon as I make an error, I get the red aborted due to warnings. It continues to wait. I make some other change to revert what I just did, because obviously I broke something. And then it runs my test again and says, oh, you're back to green, and you're good. Very, very, very easy to do continuous testing on your JavaScript code with, without any external server, without any, with just very minimal tools. And of course, you can integrate this. You wouldn't integrate Grunt Watch, but you can integrate the execution of those tests with any continuous integration tool uh, that's out there right now. Um, briefly, I want to talk about cross-browser testing, because obviously, as I mentioned, uh, we're only doing testing in PhantomJS, and that's one browser and one browser alone, and that's Pretty, pretty bad. You want to test across a lot of browsers. In order to do that, there are a lot of tools for it. Um, these are just four of them. Uh, I tend to use Sauce Labs right now. Um, what's nice about Sauce Labs, and actually BrowserStack has this as well, is uh, you create an SSH tunnel to the Sauce Labs server, and you have a configuration file that tells Sauce Labs, hey, I want to run my tests on Chrome 29 and Firefox 96, <laughs> whatever it's on. IE6, seriously, they have IE6, and they execute all of these tests in virtual machines on their servers and then just report back to you the results. And you can actually do this through a grunt task. So you could actually watch your files and then kick off a Sauce Labs uh, a test run from your command line, test across all of your targeted browsers, and get back those results into your, in your console just from your local machine without having to have anything else. Very cool. Um, Testum actually uh, runs on your machine. It will spawn real browser instances on your own machine, which is nice, except if you're on Mac, you can't do IE. And if you're on Windows, you can't do Safari. Well, not real Safari, anyway. Um, and then you've got, of course, uh, uh, the other player, Selenium. Selenium has a remote web driver. So you actually set up an external Selenium server, and uh, uh, you have tests that hit that server, and it reports back results. And that's. It's nice, but it's a little more set up. Um, browser, stack has a, browser Stack has a similar tool to Sauce Labs. Uh, you can create SSH tunnels and open things up on virtual machines. 
So that's it for cross browser testing tools. Uh, let me go back to that our slide here, and uh, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to open it up for any questions on JavaScript testing. Um, if you are comfortable, please come to the mic. If not, I will just repeat your question for you. Go ahead. No, just just yell it out. Uh, th so pulling in uh, external vendor files is always tricky. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's Drupal or anything else, honestly. Um, if, there, if there are external JavaScript files that you have to get from some vendor source, unfortunately right now the best way to do that is to actually pull those into that HTML file, the QUnit HTML file, um, and just reference them however you can. You could actually, you know, you can generate that test HTML file using Drupal. I mean, you could have... You know, a structure for that, and it could it could have your common header and stuff that pulls in all those files. Um, we actually had one where we were generating the HTML files using Node, the, the test HTML files using Node, so that we could inject the script tags and the HTML from partials. So um, that's generally what I see done: is you just pull all those vendor files into your test suite. Yeah, I've been using for like other smaller libraries. Yeah, with Drupal, I would actually say maybe try and generate those HTML, HTML files. Using Drupal, uh, um, and you could always just have a, a copy of the JavaScript files and just do it that way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for your talk today. Uh, can you uh, talk a little about a situation when the JavaScript response might be personalized based on and uh, uh, the user session or? Yep, absolutely. De dealing with variation. so, what I would say is uh, your JavaScript tests don't care about your user session. They really don't care whatsoever. If that data is in the JavaScript namespace that you're using, then there isn't a problem because you just artificially fill that namespace, those namespace objects, when your test begins. If you're having to hit a server to get that information back, I would say mock out that server. And instead of returning real results, you return John Doe every single time. For every single test, it's always John Doe. And then you can test that John Doe appears in the header and that John Doe's email address appears at the footer or whatever it needs to be. So I would say you mock out all that data. If, it's already, if you expect it to already be in, the JavaScript, in some JavaScript object, just fill that before the test runs. If uh, in in like a, a setup method, if you expect um, that test that data to be returned from an AJAX call, mock out the AJAX call and just always return the data that you know will work for your test, or that you know will fail your test, so that you can test the failure cases. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, is there a rule of thumb that you could recommend or that they should use in order to estimate how much uh, time and effort it would take to write the test? Or whatever you want? Is there a tool that I use to estimate how much time and effort it would take to write the tests? Um, a rule of thumb is, uh, my general rule of thumb is that for highly complex issues, the tests are going to take longer to write than the code. And for highly simplistic issues, the tests are going to take longer to write than the code. That's a terrible answer, but unfortunately, there isn't really a very good rule of thumb. If you're trying, if you're striving for 100% coverage, then your test should take longer, and uh, and that's just that's the the nature of being a TDD environment. That that's what it's going to be. They should take longer. Solving those problems should be oh, you know, here's my code, and here's a branch, and here's a branch, and creating all those branches isn't really that hard. Making sure that all those branches do exactly what you expect them to do is kind of tricky. But what's nice is once you set up those tests for the initial development, now you've got proper regression testing. And so when you make a change to that, you don't have to rewrite all the tests. You're just writing a new test case for a bug you found, or you're writing um, a test case for a new branch you created of your code, or whatever it is. So uh, I would say that in terms of planning, you need to plan for as much time as you're coding, you should plan for creating tests, regardless of whether you're doing TDD or not, by the way. If you're writing tests afterward, you're going to need probably more time. Yeah. Do I find the need to write test code to test my test code? Um, I, I, I see what you're laying down there. Um, I, I, I generally ignore that. 
that's not a good answer either. But um, yeah, there, there are situations where you've got, I mean, we're writing JavaScript code, so there are JavaScript functions, and you can very easily have errors in your JavaScript functions. What I find is, most of the time, my tests don't run when I have errors in that code, and so it's not a problem. What you really want to make sure you're doing is in your test blocks and those test functions that you're just calling a function and letting that function do what it's doing and returning. They're, like If you've got a parsing error, that's one thing, and you know, your test won't run, and then you know you've got a problem. Um, if there's some something that you're doing some complex logic in there, I would say abstract that concept, that con uh, complex logic to its own, its own module, its own function, and then you can actually write a test for that complex functionality. Um, but you should, if you have to do that, you really need to look at why you're doing that. And should that be part of your source code? Anything else? Yep. Uh, yeah, there's there's a ton of them. Uh, I've used a number of them. Um, JS Blanket is is one that we've used uh, frequently. We also use Istanbul. I actually like the user interface of Istanbul a little bit more. And we're using a uh, Mocha test mostly right now. And Mocha and Istanbul play nice together. Um, so I would recommend those two. But there's a, you know a horde of other ones. Those are the ones that I've used and, and enjoy. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, exactly like you saw, we write the test case for that that search functionality, right? I have, if you're properly abstracting your code uh, such that your view interaction is, is completely isolated. Uh, I, by the way, I, I don't use Backbone very often, but we have the same issue with Angular. We have the same issue with knockout code that we write um, where our views are separated and we've got to test just that. And the way we do it is we have uh, usually a partial that we load into our test case and we have uh, our view code that's hitting the the uh, that is we're passing in the elements that we want to target that we want to add event handlers to or whatever the case may be and then we are ensuring that those elements are properly positioned where we expect them that a modal does in fact show up and because you're running these tests in a browser even with phantom you can test that that element that pop-up element does exist that its visibility is is showing that it's not display none, whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, we, we we execute those tests just like we would anything else and just like we did our, our search tests here. Um, again, you have to make sure that your code is is accessible, right? You have to have testable JavaScript code even in your views. You have to have code that you can access outside of the context of this is a view that's loaded through all of the other mechanism of Backbone or Knockout or Angular or whatever. Anything else? I think we've got, we're right at time. Uh, I have a horde of stickers up here. Feel free to come get one. Say hello. Hit me up uh, on Twitter. Uh, these slides are there, uh, bit.ly slash testing hyphen JS. And please, if you can, go to bit.ly slash testing dash JS dash review. That's uh, the review for this session. I would really appreciate your feedback, good or bad. I appreciate any and all of it. Uh, feel free to come up and punch me later if you didn't like it. And I'll hang out around here, and I'll be here uh, all week, so come up and say hello. Thank you for attending the first session.